There was a time not so long ago when the UK's trans representation in the media was... Eddie Howard. Emily Howard? I'm a lady, Emily Howard, yes. <laughs> I've only been on the hormones 18 months. So my nipples are like bullets. I said I used to be a man. <laughs> Bastard. A bit cringe. Transness was comedy, it had kind of always been a joke, and although times were a change in, it wasn't clear if things were going to improve anytime soon. Then, around 2012, a trans media group, the All About Trans Project, met with head of BBC Creative Resources, Ian Critchley, to talk about the lack of positive trans representation, and from that meeting, the Trans Comedy Award was born. The BBC put out a call for original comedy scripts featuring trans characters, and rather than have some grim, gritty drama about how horrible being trans is, having a trans character be the comedy protagonist, that's a pretty fun idea. Out of 320 submissions, the winning script belonged to Elliot Kerrigan, a writer with no previous credits, at least on IMDb, who, as far as I know, is a cisgender man. Which is fine, I think cis people can write trans people. It's a shame a trans writer couldn't get a gig out of this, but hey, if it's the best script, it's the best script. I promise I'm not one of the unreasonable social justice warriors. I'm a good one. Like and subscribe. Patreon. Broadcast in 2015, the resulting show Boy Meets Girl is the heartwarming tale of a young man named Leo who meets and falls in love with a woman named Judy, played by Rebecca Root, who reveals on their first date. I was born with a penis. Well, what a wacky thing to say! We can only assume going forward that this character will be outgoing and hilarious. So much fun! The show is in a similar vein to Gavin and Stacey, which is what they were going for, though it also kind of reminds me of Bob and Rose. It follows both Leo's and Judy's families as these two very different wacky groups find themselves becoming entwined by the love between Leo and Judy. Kerrigan based the character of Leo's mum on his own mum, and you really get the feeling that this guy is kind of writing about his own family. This is a family he knows and understands. But weirdly, it, out of both families, Judy feels like the odd one out. For example, everyone speaks with a northern accent, except Judy. I actually transitioned pretty late in life, but I was 32. Even though she's supposed to be northern, all the other actors clearly come from a comedy background, except Judy. And the writing itself feels almost like it pushes Judy to the side to focus on everyone else. And I think maybe in this instance what's happening is that Kerrigan knew how to write a northern family when they're all cis. But he doesn't know trans people, so Judy seems like a stranger to him. But okay, that's still fine. The point is that it's good representation. Judy is the hero, we're rooting for her, we're rooting for Rebecca Root. But there was one heinous crime the show committed, something I find frankly unforgivable. It's fucking boring as shit. I feel like a total butthole face saying that, because obviously this show was born out of people trying to do good. Rebecca Root is doing her best with the material and the situation. Everyone involved is clearly set out to do good work, to represent trans people on British television right, for possibly the first time ever. But I hate this show. I hate it. Like, it really annoys me how boring and unfunny it is. Me swag is so hard that knee won't can match it. It's off the hook! I'm not easily bored either. I watch 60s Doctor Who reconstructions of lost episodes with low quality photos and no remaining footage for fun. I'm kind of a loser, but the point is, I do boring for fun, and this was still boring to me. And I don't think it's from the acting. I love some of these actors. They're really great, and they're doing their absolute best with what they're given, but the scripts. Oh shit. Kerrigan even said that the brother character's best lines aren't even from the script, they're improv, so the script is actually even less funny than what's going on on screen. Like I said, these other actors are clearly seasoned comedy actors, but Root isn't. So there's this weird tone of everyone else hamming it up, and Root is the only one who thinks she's in a drama rather than a comedy. There's a whole age gap subplot, because Leo is only 26, whereas Judy is 39. But Leo feels even younger than that to me, maybe because he lives with his parents, he, he just feels really inexperienced. And Root was actually five years older than her character was when this was filmed, so the age gap feels even wider than just 13 years. And it's a bit awkward. For the most part, the show isn't offensive. I'm not angry because I think it's cruel or unkind or unsympathetic or even bad representation, really. I'm angry because 
it could have been a blast and it's just dull. Uh, it feels like we end up being the exact kind of boring killjoys bigots expect us to be. There's an episode where Leo comes across an old photo of Judy from before she transitioned. Judy acts completely unlike any trans person I've ever met and just laughs it off and forgets it even happened. Leo is weirded out by having seen the photo and can't have sex with Judy because of it. So then he is sad for a bit until his dad reminds him that he loves Judy. So he goes to Judy and they hug. That, that's the main plot of this comedy episode of comedy. Essentially, Leo got freaked out because he's not gay and seeing his girlfriend look like a man made him feel gay and then it confused and upset him, I think, I guess, that's what's supposed to have happened. But like, that could be hilarious. That's part of the weird hilarity of trans existence. We ruin people's sense of their own sexuality and those people often have to go on a journey of figuring out whether they might be secretly gay or straight and there's so much comedy that can come out of that. But it doesn't. Leo just sits and is sad and then he goes to hug Judy. The end. Comedy masterpiece. <sighs> okay, imagine, imagine this as an alternative. The photo makes Leo uncomfortable and Judy assumes that it's because he saw her from before her transition, but it turns out what it actually was is Judy had some real tight jeans on and it, she was particularly well endowed in those days. This makes Leo insecure about his own masculinity and a little bit shy to get naked in front of Judy. A comedy of errors ensues where they each think that there's an entirely different problem and ultimately in a sweet ending they realise that they really just needed to communicate about it because Actually, Judy loves tiny penises. <laughs> there, BBC, give me a job. I fix your comedy for you. Comedy genius. I know what I'm doing. I'm a professional. Penis. <laughs> but that's not what happened. Leo just sits and is sad. Then he goes to hug Judy. The end. BBC comedy gold. There are just so many ways to make the trans experience funny in a way which is authentic to our experiences. And this just fails. In the first season finale, after five episodes of underwhelming playing it safe episodes they decide that they really need to just go for it with the transphobia judy is a fucking bloke which is a little jarring though i have to be real it, it hurt my heart to watch but at least it was interesting it's just a shame they couldn't make a show interesting without exploring the depths of a cis woman's transphobia because ultimately that's the perspective of the show a cis perspective. Here's Judy getting to respond to that transphobia. What do you want me to do, Pam? You want me to walk away? It would break both our hearts. I've hit a woman before, oh yes. And don't think I wouldn't lay one on a... a transsexual. So does this mean you're okay with us? I can learn to live with it. This storyline isn't comedic at all, it's pure drama, but when it gets to the drama, it turns out this show isn't really about Judy and Leo, it's about Leo's mum, Pam. She's the person who has to change and grow, and she's really the only one who gets to. And here, Judy has to tuck her tail between her legs and heal. Is that, is that what this show is? About submitting to the cis audience and saying, please accept me. I'm just a simple wee trans. The focus on Pam is wonderfully highlighted for me in this YouTube interview where the cast is asked about trans people's reactions to the show and the actress who plays Pam answers and when she goes to hand the question over to Rebecca Root, the interviewer cuts her off and ends the interview. See, that's comedy right there. Gavin and Stacey, a show which inspired Boy Meets Girl, works because of a few things. The lead actors have great chemistry to start with. Also, the theme is really this idea of young, innocent, stupid love. It feels real and was inspired by a true story even. I don't know how much of a difference that makes, but it, it feels authentic. It reminds me of that feeling of being young and in love for the first time. It's just cute to watch. But Judy and Leo, on the other hand, have no chemistry at all. They're not even from the same generation, so it doesn't have that youthful energy of Gavin and Stacey. It feels contrived and like it's there to teach me a lesson about how even trans people deserve love. If this wasn't trans representation, I wouldn't have watched it, period. And that's the true crime, that you've made a show which is meant to represent trans people for the first time, but no one particularly wants to watch. It's not even on Rotten Tomatoes to rate. No one watched this show. Is it the burden of representation which produces this lusterless, derivative, manufactured poop? 
But wait a second, Verily Bitchy, are you saying we should have problematic representation in our shows just to make them fun for you? Do you really want transphobia in our representation? Does everything have to be about you, Verily? Yes, I am saying that and everything does have to be about me. I just, I just love that transphobia. I just want to gobble it up. <laughs> love Simon was a teen rom-com which received pretty good reviews, even though it wasn't particularly romantic or comedic. Beside the fact that Simon is played by a piece of stale chewing gum who is so deeply heterosexual that he couldn't even play gay well in a scene where he's imagining being super duper gay. I, I mean, look at that walk. That is, a, that is a heterosexual walk right there. They kind of stripped the character bare. They tried to minimize all conflicts in his life down to gay identity. So Simon would face absolutely no backlash from coming out. He knew that and was open about it at the beginning of the film. He might be teased a bit by some bullies who would get in a lot of trouble for it, but that's it. The whole plot line of how he screws over his friends because he's blackmailed tries to force some tension into his life, but otherwise there isn't any. His friends will all accept him, his family will accept him. They try to pretend that there's some weird tension with the family after he comes out, but it's totally contrived. His mum and sister support him completely, and he just doesn't get to talk to his dad about it, and when he does, turns out his dad was fine about it anyway. I wouldn't change anything about you. Just stop crying. I'm trying. They tried to give us the impression early on that Simon, I guess, didn't want to lose out on hearing his dad make weird creepy jokes about women by, by coming out, or like, Maybe his family will somehow stop enjoying watching TV together once he's out, but it's, it's fake tension. Simon has nothing to lose and everything to gain from coming out. And it's because they've kind of stripped him of any other characteristics besides being gay. They've tried to kind of neutralize him in this like standard privileged position where, you know, like whiteness is kind of seen as neutral. I feel like that's kind of what they were going for. They were trying to remove any other kind of marginalized qualities that he might have so that it would only be his identity as a gay person that was an issue that caused any tension. But even when it comes to being gay, he's completely desexualized to a ridiculous extent. Part of the discomfort of being a queer teenager, to my memory, is the fact that you get turned on by the wrong people. And part of the discomfort of being a teenager at all is that you get turned on. But Simon doesn't have a sexuality. He just wants to kiss twunks and is revolted by all boys who don't look like models. Also, no femmes, please, only mask for mask. Imagine Love Simon's grinder profile. Like, that's they, there's a reason they didn't show that in the movie. The movie would have been canceled so quick. <laughs> Overall, the movie is fine, I guess but it's not as good as critics made it out to be because they were probably scared that if they didn't rate it well, Hollywood would think that gay characters weren't profitable, but it's bad and it's boring in a similar way to Boy Meets Girl. They've had to strip the minority lead down so they're inoffensive to the audience, a straight audience specifically, and thus made an incredibly boring character. Another TV show which I think similarly embodies this crime of boring trans representation is Supergirl. Now, I enjoy Supergirl. I watched it faithfully from beginning to end, but I mainly enjoy Supergirl because I I like when girl goes smash smash and, and shoot lasers from her eyeballs. Supergirl wasn't the best show, and whenever it would try to send a message to its viewers, it was far from subtle. Nia Nal, a half alien with magic dream powers, was introduced to the show in 2018, portrayed by trans actress Nicole Maines. Nia is a reporter who works with Supergirl and eventually becomes a superhero. She doesn't come out at first, though when she does... I am a transgender woman. Thank you. For sharing your truth. If someone responded, if someone responded to me coming out with, thank you for sharing your truth, I'd be like, oh my god, you're so fucking welcome. <laughs> but it, like, it's great that they're trying. Most of the time, the show doesn't even discuss her being trans, it only comes up in a handful of episodes, and I imagine most casual viewers who have missed an episode or two might not even know that she's trans. The writing on Supergirl was generally pretty poor, and they kind of reserved jokes for like one character. I think Nicole Maines is actually pretty funny in interviews, and it's such a shame that this couldn't be translated into her character. Like, if you just let Nicole Maines just play Nicole Maines, Neo would be hilarious. To go to being told that I was uh, a danger to to my classmates 
was um, mm. crap. <laughs> but on the note of should we allow transphobia in our TV shows, I bring up Nia Nal because of an episode in the last season with her sister. You see, her sister thought she was meant to inherit the dream powers from their mother because one daughter from each generation inherits the powers. And no one expected it to be Nia because she's trans. You're not even a real woman. And when her sister brings this up, they stop speaking for a long time. And I really liked that this happened. It felt like a very real moment in a world of thank you for your truths. But when she finally meets her sister again, Maeve admits, I never thought you weren't a real woman. And it's like, come on, don't backpedal now. You did think she wasn't a real woman in the sense that you thought magic space dream powers were tied to some kind of gender essentialism. Just admit it, Maeve. You're fucking turf, Maeve. You're fucking magic space dream turf. You're fucking magic space turf. Just fucking say it. You love JK Rowling, Maeve, just say it. Just fucking say you love JK Rowling. I know that some people just don't like any transphobia or biphobia or homophobia or any kind of bigotry in their stories, but I just do. Really because I like seeing people overcome it and thrive despite it. it I just can't relate to these worlds in which bigotry only exists for space alien phobia or whatever. But sometimes instead of the problems of transphobia or little transphobic microaggressions, we get some kind of toxic, really good ally-ness. Sex Education introduced a non-binary character in its third season, Cal Bowman. And I just found them so boring. Everyone else was having these crazy sex scenes and weird complex storylines. And Cal was just a pothead whose season arc ending was just doesn't date nice guy who respects and loves them. So they have to break up because their identities don't line up because he's a straight cis guy. So even though they are attracted to each other and get along great, they don't end up together. I, I guess because the show thinks monosexual cis people don't date non-binary people or something. He says he doesn't have a problem being in a queer relationship. His mums are lesbians, but because he's a straight guy and Cal is non-binary, they can't be together despite everything else fitting just fine. Like the reason the sex didn't go well was because Jackson was trying really, really hard to be super respectful and somehow I guess that was bad. You really gotta say be beautiful. Yeah, that's a gendered word. And I'd also still be into you if you weren't beautiful. Not that I don't find you beautiful. Also, I do think men can be beautiful too. I'm sorry. I don't know, it's, it's fine, it's okay. Obviously a lot of trans people experience dysphoria which can make sex difficult, but it definitely doesn't make it impossible. We could have gone into that, shown how to have a good respectful which doesn't trigger. The show is about sex. There are plenty of ways to do this without reducing Jackson's entire sexuality to being a cishet incapable of being intimate with a non-binary person. I think your cishet brain maybe exploded a bit. But I feel like the show is trying so hard to be good representation, they just didn't do it. It feels completely unnatural. I feel like what the writers thought they were portraying here was a cishet guy's inability to handle being in a queer relationship. But what I see when I watch it is Cal's complete inability to communicate about anything. And I feel like the story I'm being told is not consistent with the story that I'm seeing. And in the end, just to make clear that Cal was always meant to be a primarily didactic character, they give us a lesson on binding because the internet doesn't exist in sex education because it's set in a parallel universe, 1980s American British land. So no one can Google binding. I did it for a while with ace bandages until I nearly broke a rib. I didn't realize that they tighten over time so they can restrict breathing severely. That binder is designed for safer chest compression. You might be tempted to wear two binders or wear a size smaller, but you shouldn't. I feel so guilty when I talk shit about characters that I know other people like. I just found this ending contrived. I found the Star Trek non-binary representation to be a little dull too. I really appreciate Adira and Grey, and I honestly cried in the flashback episode, but Discovery is trying so hard to do good representation that I just find it a bit meh. You have the two good monogamous gay husbands, and now they get to adopt two good monogamous trans kids. And there's nothing wrong with being married or monogamous. I know married monogamous people feel very oppressed sometimes, but hey, I, I support your choices. You're so fucking valid. Maybe it's just me, but it feels a bit condescending in a world like Star Trek where most of the time characters barely manage to hold down relationships, let alone get married. And the inspiration obviously comes from the still fairly recent acceptance in many places of same-sex marriage. I don't find them very compelling as a couple or very interesting, but sure is 
great representation to have them married. But in season one, it all seemed like it wasn't going to be so simple. Culbert actually literally straight up died. And this was controversial because obviously the bury your gaze trope sucks. But in the context of the show, I didn't think Culber's death in season one was a problem. The main hero, Michael, had had practically everyone she ever loved killed. In episode two, the captain's death is totally her own fault, and now her boyfriend turns out to be a Klingon spy. Killing off main characters was kind of Star Trek Discovery's thing. Season one was very Game of Thrones, to be honest. The show changed a lot after that, but in the context of the type of show Discovery was at the time, I felt like it wasn't treating the gay characters any differently than it was the straight characters. And on top of that, it was obvious to me that Culber was gonna at least come back as like a mushroom ghost at some point. That make, it makes sense if you watch the show. Literally the same day as Culber's death aired, the showrunners announced that he was not really dead and would be coming back. In this situation, there was no room to drop hints or keep secrets. It had to be explicitly spoiled for us to protect the show's reputation. And I, I have mixed feelings about that. Like a straight cis viewer wouldn't have to expect that when it comes to straight cis characters. Adira, who got a lot of press for being the first out non-binary character in the show, can be compared to the 90s Star Trek character Jadzia Dax, who was conceptually similar to Adira, though not conceived as LGBT representation. Dax has lived many lives, as a woman and as a man, and Dax has loved women and loved men. Her captain calls her old man, she shares the first ever same-sex kiss in Star Trek, and she's wild and fun and hilarious, and even though everyone knows she used to be a man, all the straight men fancy her. Jazia is gritty and complicated and problematic in a way Adira isn't. Some of her most interesting and radical moments revolve around the fact that she just straight up used to be a guy. That layer to her character just meant there were totally new stories to explore. And I find Adira a little disappointing in that respect, especially because they're so easy to compare to Jadzia. And I can't help but feel like what makes Adira less interesting is the demand for good representation. When Adira was first introduced to the show, people online were angry because they had been promised a non-binary character, but Adira was only referred to with she and her pronouns. And obviously some non-binary people in real life use she or he pronouns, but that didn't matter. Folks didn't have the patience to wait for Adira to come out. They needed them to be out right away in order to be good representation, not knowing that the reason the character wasn't out yet was because the writers were waiting for the actor who plays Adira to give the go-ahead that they were ready to be outed. The whole behind the scenes creative process was irrelevant to the audience's demand for good representation. It's a TV show. The story exists beyond what you have seen because it's intended to go on for weeks or even years longer. And it's very clear with both Adira and Culber, the team behind the show knew what they were doing. They, they didn't need to be called out. If representation has to be subject to our immediate demands, is that a good way to make good stories? Is that how art is made? by Twitter demands. On the 1st of January 2020, award-winning online magazine Clark's World published a short story titled I Sexually Identify as an Attack Helicopter. For anyone who doesn't remember, this line was a meme for years. It was the bullshit joke that transphobes made to mock the idea of having a gender identity. People were incredibly offended that a story with this title existed at all. People who didn't read the story presumed that it must have been transphobic, that they were being trolled by the magazine. The author, Isabel Falls' bio, said nothing except that she was born in 1988. Some people thought that because the number 88 is sometimes used by Nazis as code, that Falls' bio was code for saying, I'm a Nazi. In reality, Isabel Fall was a trans woman who felt that the meme had been sufficiently appropriated by trans people like herself that she could write something really interesting if she just took the idea seriously. What if you could sexually identify as an attack helicopter? What would that even mean? The result is a story in which the idea of gender identity has been appropriated by the military to assign gender roles to soldiers such as attack helicopter and send them to war. At first when I started reading it, I felt like this could be transphobic. I felt like it could just be taking the piss, but I got into it and I felt the sincerity of it, the work that went into imagining this world, the dissection of gender. It explores the power of gender, the way our minds understand gender intuitively to an amazing extent. The story challenged me and that was kind of exciting to be honest. Once my defenses were down, it felt good to read, like the best science fiction works, like I was really seeing a whole other world. I found myself thinking while I was reading, the attack helicopter isn't a metaphor for how silly gender is. 
It's a testament to the power of gender, as well as the importance of those who question it. I kill for the same reason men don't wear short skirts, the same reason I used to pluck my brows, the reason NB people are supposed to be unfair and stupid, yes, but still androgynous with short hair. Are those good reasons to do something? If you say no, honestly no, can you tell me you break these rules without fear or cost? The idea of our liberation as trans people, as queer people, being appropriated by the government to exploit us, I can kind of see a parallel here with how our stories are co-opted by massive media corporations like Disney and Netflix and sold to us. The more liberation we achieve, the more money the big corporations who shunned us begin to make off of us. Pride was a protest. Pride is now an ad campaign for big businesses. That's liberation. In the meantime, what happens to small creators like Isabel Fall? Fall received so much harassment over the story, she asked Clark's world to take it down. Experiencing self-harm and suicidal ideation, she checked into a psychiatric ward. One criticism she received was that no real woman would ever write a story like this, which exacerbated her gender dysphoria, and it seems like from an interview with her that she's decided to detransition because of all this. With social media, the way that we demand stories has changed. And the way that we engage with the people who create them has changed. By Twitter and Instagram, we often have direct access to messaging a celebrity with a real chance that they'll see it. Westworld writers revealed that they literally changed the plot at the last minute when some Reddit users had figured out what the next big twist was going to be. Which is such a terrible reason to change a story, but okay. Writers are listening to the people on the webs, and if we don't like something, we can make that dislike trend, and sometimes the aggression from that can cause a lot of hurt if the creator is more vulnerable. That's an incredible power to have, one which I'm not sure we know how to be responsible with yet. It's hard to tweet as an individual while keeping in mind that your single tweet might be combined with thousands of others and turned into something beyond your control or what you imagined. Like with Isabel Fall, I think smaller creators are more willing to take risks and say something new and radical because they have less to lose, or so they think. Companies who want your money are going to produce representation which is boring but in line with the demand. Either way, no one will ever cancel a big corporation. You might cancel someone who works for them, but if you cancel the company, there's no one to meet your demands. People are far more expendable than a company, right? I think we can be distrustful as LGBT people because we're used to getting hurt. But what's the cost of making a world with no hard edges? Part two, more of me talking about the same thing. So, good representation is often just very boring, <laughs> but don't we need it? Aren't respectable representations required for people to learn about us? Orange is the New Black's trans character is messed up. She's a criminal, she stole the credit card from someone who was presumably the victim of their house burning down and spent that person's money on her transition. In prison she tries to steal an old lady's hormone pills. She's really not a great upstanding example of trans representation. But people loved her. That character launched Laverne Cox into stardom and practically revolutionised trans representation on television forever. Orange is the New Black wasn't perfect. I feel like I have to say that, like, no TV show is perfect, there's no such thing as a perfect show or film or book, that's not the function of art to be perfect. But if I don't say it's not perfect, someone will call me out in the comments for not appreciating how problematic it was. But yeah, it's not perfect, but it's about a group of messed up weirdos, including various lesbians and bi women, one of whom was the main character, and we loved it. It really took the world by storm. My punk rapper brother was watching that show everyone was into it. It was so popular at its height. It was invested in telling women's stories, but not in a way which cared about respectability, and as a result we were all talking about who our favourite criminals on Netflix were for years. It was around 1998 when the American public acceptance of homosexuality crossed over from the majority being unaccepting to the majority being accepting, and it's more or less been increasing ever since. So if we look back on gay representation, gay men's representation in particular, what are the 90s films everyone remembers loving. Was it in and out a heartwarming, funny but ultimately neutered film which has to entirely desexualize its gay characters in order to make them acceptable? Or was it The Birdcage, the film about drag club owners who try to deceive their conservative future in-laws into thinking they're a straight couple? You know, I think homosexuality, one of the things that's weakening this country. That's what I thought until I found out Alexander the Great was a 
Talk about gays in the military. The Birdcage was nominated for and even won a ton of awards and is actually a remake of a much older French film from the 70s, which had a series of sequels and a Broadway musical adaptation and was itself based on a play. So that is a fun story just dying to be seen over and over again, regardless of respectability. It might be cliche, it might be stereotyping, but those characters are rich and fun and you empathize with them. And to this day, people talk about how great the birdcage is. We remember Priscilla Queen of the Desert about two drag queens and a trans woman traveling across Australia, which was a such a massive surprise hit, despite being problematic that it became a musical which has been running since 2006. We remember Queer as Folk, which is about three completely off the rails gay guys and which immediately spawned an American adaptation and has a new version in development right now. For slightly older lesbian representation, we have But I'm a Cheerleader, a film taking the piss out of how romantic and erotic gay conversion camps might be. I myself was once a gay. Now I'm an ex-gay, Megan. And then there's the L word, would we really call that show good representation? It was really about lesbians behaving badly, and for all the criticisms we have, I don't think better behaved lesbians would have made it any more fun. I actually think bisexuals often get a lot of really fun and interesting representation, mainly because people don't tend to give a crap about us, so they're like, it's fine, you can be messed up and evil. So even in Star Trek where they're like, Oh, wholesome trends and gay representation. They're like, look at the evil, sexually abusive bisexual one. And the one out bisexual so far in, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been Loki, who is great fun, but also like kind of a fascist mass murder a little bit, just a little bit. But someone like Captain Jack from Doctor Who, who just flaunted his bisexuality and didn't give a crap about looking like a bi stereotype, that was so thrilling to me. It was inspiring. If I'm like Jack, I don't have to give a shit what people think about me. I don't have to care about stereotypes. And to see how everyone just loved that character, regardless of his naughty behavior, that had a big impact on me. For the record, I'm not calling for all representation to be over the top time travel superheroes and whatever. And I know in the past I've called for what I call the normal bisexual in representation, but I think you can do normal people and still make them fun because normal people are fucking weird. Feel Good is a great example of two weird, but also just kind of basic disaster bisexuals. After all, isn't every bisexual a disaster bisexual at heart? It's probably worth noting that most of the shows and films I just listed were created by LGBT people. I do appreciate that a bit of simple, nice representation is good. A show like Boy Meets Girl is good, but it kind of reminds me of how when someone tweets like, trans people are valid, and it's like, okay, I guess I like that. It's not like a great tweet or like clever or, or funny or groundbreaking, it's just, it's facts and that's fine. My hot take isn't that boring representation is bad. It's just that you don't aim to make a boring story. No one does and no one wants to watch it. Boy Meets Girl ultimately slipped under the radar because it was inoffensive and dull. This show was made with the intention of helping people to empathize with trans people but we live now in the age of streaming television. It's never been easier to choose what you wanna see. And if you are the kind of person who really hates trans people, then you're just gonna watch something else instead of Boy Meets Girl or Supergirl. And in cinemas, were straight homophobes really gonna go and see Love, Simon? Or was it made because there was already an existing market for people willing to pay for gay stories? Will and Grace premiered in 1998, the same year American public acceptance of homosexuality had become the majority, a time when sitcoms had already started to break the mold of revolving around traditional families and began frequently focusing on found families such as with friends. It followed on the heels of various successful gay comedy films and was far from the first sitcom to feature gay main characters. It had been almost three decades since the Stonewall Riots at this point. Will and Grace didn't make the world ready, it was a product of that readiness. I think maybe the best way to get people watching is to make the show unmissable. Make the show everyone's talking about. And that's not Boy Meets Girl, that's Orange is the New Black. That's not Judy, that's Electra Evangelista. But whether people are talking about your show or not, does television, do films, does literature really inspire social change? Or does social change inspire them. When you think about the Stonewall Riots, what TV shows, what films do you think inspired them? And no, Judy Garland's death did not incite the Stonewall Riots, that is a myth. It was clearly Star Trek getting cancelled. Kurt Vonnegut famously said, 
During the Vietnam War, every respectable artist in this country was against the war. It was like a laser beam. We were all aimed in the same direction. The power of this weapon turns out to be that of a custard pie dropped from a stepladder six feet high. I often feel like we a little bit overestimate the importance of creative works for social change. And the idea that diversity in the media is at the core of social change can be very good for producers of that media. You keep watching Star Trek knowing how Uhura once inspired Whoopi Goldberg and wondering how Adira Tal might inspire trans kids today. And that's good. And also very good for Star Trek to be able to sell the idea of diversity. Again, don't get me wrong, the diversity is good, it's great, it's important. But when has Star Trek ever inspired a riot, a protest? A protest that wasn't about getting more Star Trek. Keep in mind that Star Trek only started after the beginning of the civil rights movement, three years after King's I Have a Dream speech. Explicitly gay and trans characters only joined the crew of the USS Discovery half a century after the Stonewall Riots, half a century after the original Star Trek got cancelled. We buy the idea that TV creates the change, but sometimes TV is following trends which already sell. But okay, okay, representation is good. And it does make a difference, a little bit at a time. For some people, it will be the first time they see a minority person. It will be how they're introduced to that minority. And in fact, studies have found evidence suggesting that reading fiction can actually help improve a person's capacity for empathy. When you are able to be transported into a fictional narrative, you are able to exercise your empathy by engaging intimately with fictional characters. And it seems like film has a similar effect. Roger Ebert once said, For me, the movies are like a machine that generates empathy. If it's a great movie, it lets you understand a little bit more about what it's like to be a different gender, a different race, a different age, a different economic class, a different nationality, a different profession, different hopes, aspirations, dreams, and fears. It helps us to identify with the people who are sharing this journey with us. And that, to me, is the most noble thing that good movies can do, and it's a reason to encourage them and to support them and to go to them. Fiction can have an incredible reach and influence in our lives. But in order for a character to make an impact on a viewer, the character has to feel authentic, right? If I feel like I'm being preached to or treated like an ignorant child, my walls go up and I won't be able to empathize with that character. Like with the sex education scenes with Cal, I felt like this was here to teach me a lesson rather than to be good drama television. But if I'm emotionally attached to a character, that's when the empathy kicks in. And what inspires an emotional connection between the audience and the character? Do they have to be good? Game of Thrones became one of the, oh, sorry, <laughs> hold on. Um, Game of Thrones is super fucking problematic, but Game of Thrones became one of the most discussed shows on television for the better part of a decade. People empathized with Cersei, they empathized with Jaime. Even the good guys became dark and killers and we loved it. Well, not all of it. It was easy to care about Daenerys for a lot of us when her character felt authentic and consistent, but her behavior in the last season of Game of Thrones took us out of it. It didn't feel earned by the story. It didn't feel true to what we'd seen before. The dragon burned the throne in a violent act of symbolism. It was trashy writing. There were demands for a remake of the entire season. If we didn't buy the story, we couldn't empathize with the character and vice versa, actually. Whatever it is that makes you step into a character's shoes, that makes you feel like you understand them, whatever it is that makes you cry at a tragedy and whatever it is that makes you give up on a story and turn it off, it isn't the ethical purity of a character. An emotional connection with an audience doesn't happen just because you put someone on screen and let them pet a dog to show how they're actually a good person. I didn't connect emotionally to Nia Nal in her first episode when she was telling me how her day had gone all wrong or when she was telling me how she cares about the people and creating new jobs or when she told Jimmy Olsen her truth. Despite the fact that these moments were all clearly designed to tell me I was supposed to care. I connected with her when she took us home to see her life and the tensions in her family caused by their weird biological essentialism in regards to dream magic. I saw her respond to that in a real way, rejecting her powers, trying to deny that this was happening to her because she couldn't live with the idea of letting down her sister. That felt real and complicated. An emotional connection happens when you tell a good, engaging story. 
quality storytelling can make you empathize with a villain, it can make you root for a murderer. But I think the hesitation a lot of people have with this kind of representation is the idea that you might come out of it thinking, for example, all trans people are liars, Nianal is a liar, she lied to her family, all trans people do is lie. The answer to that seems pretty straightforward to me. Firstly, you don't have to be a good guy character to be the protagonist. And there's a big difference between a villain and a protagonist in the eyes of the viewer. Second, there just plain needs to be more trans title characters. I often think about LGBT supporting characters and whether or not they should be allowed to die or make mistakes. I don't think the problem is that LGBT characters are more likely to die, but that also supporting characters are more likely to die than the main protagonist. If you had 20 TV shows on right now all with trans title characters, I promise you there wouldn't be a lot of death happening between them. When iconic lesbian witch Tara died in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it was in part because she's not Willow. Willow wouldn't have died because she was a main character, though if she'd been the titular character, she would have been even less likely to die. Hey, I died twice. Well, not permanently, you get my point. That's not to say I don't think the bury your gaze trope is at least partially a result of some unconscious bias on the part of the writers, but if your lead is gay, you don't have a lot of room to kill them, and I honestly believe we're going to continue to struggle with whether it's okay to ever kill an LGBT character or other minority characters in TV fiction for as long as they remain underrepresented. One of the most popular representations of trans characters today is Jules from HBO's Euphoria. The first time I tried watching Euphoria, I wasn't really feeling it. It felt a little fetishizing of Jules, and that put me off. And overall, it felt like. Like I knew which appendage Sam Levinson used to type these scripts. But I gave it another go for this video. I watched the whole thing, and to be honest, based on the first season, I think most of the appeal for Jules was that she's very pretty, literally played by a model. But there was also some backlash against her character, who some people saw as a villain. And that's where it got interesting. I think part of the reason it's possible to read Jules that way is because in season one, she feels similar to Judy in Boy Meets Girl. She's always slightly out of reach, more distant from the narrator than the other supporting characters. Maybe because of the cis writer not quite knowing how to interpret the inner depths of a trans teenage girl's brain. But because of the Twitter meme of Jules is really the villain, show creator Sam Levinson teamed up with Jules actress Hunter Schaefer to write a special episode. And finally, Jules feels real to me. There's this line about how she kind of wants to stop taking her tea blockers. My entire life, I've been trying to conquer femininity. I feel like femininity conquered me. I think I really want to go off my hormones. I've always thought of puberty as like a broadening. I think it's like why I was always so scared of it, you know? Because in my head, women were always like, small and thin and delicate. And it feels so authentic in a way you just don't see on television or in film because people don't know that trans people have deeply complex relationships to their transition and to their sexuality and to beauty standards. Cis people couldn't have written this. It had to be a trans woman. It's really the type of moment which we would rather nobody knew about because we always have to talk about our transitions as if they're a pure godsend because we're scared people will take the transition away from us. But I think that's great. And like with Orange is the New Black, it's part of what makes that character a little messy, but way more authentic and sympathetic. There's this small web series I've been watching. It's just a series of shorts. It's called Transaction. It's about a trans woman who's just a bit of an idiot and it's performed by and written by a trans woman. And it's pretty funny, not earth shatteringly great, but it's a laugh and the jokes are truly only the kind of jokes a trans person can tell. I am pregnant because of all the estrogen I take. It's either going to be a girl or an incredibly high achieving homosexual baby boy. A gaby. I feel like on Facebook these days, all the different react emojis have screwed us over. Whenever I see a post that's like, trans person talks about how their whole family is dead or something like that. There'll be like a hundred laugh reacts attached to the post as the second or third most common react because people use those reacts to troll and it's horrible. Thanks, Mark. But on this show, it's like likes and loves and laughs because everyone is laughing. It's just disreputable fun. So even in a show from Turf Island, the trans woman is getting the laughs and winning. I love killing with kindness. I love people that just if you can make somebody laugh, it brings down every barrier they have. And it's my personal mission to make the kind of people that probably wouldn't like this laugh with me at this experience. And I think she's right. And that's why 
I think good representation kind of sucks. <laughs> and why my favorite, why my favorite representation is the bad kind. Wink. Television gets kind of a bad reputation for being kind of cheap, kind of crappy, but TV can be art. And we're in the golden age of TV right now. Television should be art. And I mean that in the broadest sense that some art will make you laugh, some will make you cry. But either way, you will get to a point in any good story where you hope the protagonist wins. And that is the moment you realize you are empathizing with a minority and you might carry that with you into your real life. We don't need respectability in our representation. We just need more of it behind the scenes and center stage. And when we get that, I think we'll start to see a major shift in the quality of those characters. And that's why the BBC should just let me take over as head of all comedy and drama and also also be the new Doctor Who, obviously. And um, give me BBC News as well, because I'll fucking, I'll sort them out. So vote for me in the next Doctor Who leader, head of the BBC ele election. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Um, go ahead and smash all the buttons below, except for the dislike button. And maybe don't hit the subscribe one again, because that'll unsubscribe you. But you know, it's your life. You have agency. Choice matters. And if you'd like to support my channel, consider supporting my Patreon. And thanks to all my patrons for sharing your truth with me. And a special thanks to Kat R, Danny Aiden Stone, Justin DeLima, Mathete, Siobhan, Stephen Bailey, Tasha Heim, The Bipan Library, The Digital Witch, Erin, AJ, AJ, Alice, Emilia D, Andreas Evans, Apathetic Gaiety, Ardor, Eric Parkinson, B, Ben Hengst, Beslaf, Beth Hershey, Break Every Yoke, Catriona Alexi, Charis Edwards, Chloe Strange, CJ Gibson, Connor Thompson, Deanna McMillan, ES, Irienby, Ellen Hogan, Ellie Cannard, Elsie Astro, Emery James Fairgrieve, Evergarden Wall, Fafa Elania, Felixer of Life, Gavin Salmon, Good Old Floyd, Hellfrog, Henry Mead, Hilda Mangold, Jam Kwasowski, Jamie Pope, Jasper Rose, Jaden Peters, Jessage, Juicy Fantasy Queen Plant Hookups, Jules, Jules, wait, there's two Jules's, <laughs> Jules and Jules, Juliana C, Julius, Kale, Kate and Jess, Kim Y, Kisa, Lacey Cox, Lillian Brink, Lord Asriel, Marla, McKenning Wood, Miss Mad, Mizake Damazan, Muggsy, Mirren McGlynn, Nico, Nick Snary, Nina, Octo, Odbjorn the Frizzy, Olive, Peach, Pregnant Seinfeld, Queer Aesthetic, Rebecca Peacock, River Haddocock, Rob St. Mary, Rog the Shell, Samson Lopez, Sarah R, Savard Moosin, Soya Donk, Shaved Headed By, She Algorithm, Sithvich, Soy, Spaghetti Rabbit, Steve, Straw Fox, Summertime Killer, Susie S, Sveeple the Trans Boy Valkyrie, The Children of Jack Acid, Tia Till, Tina Gigia, Troy Zayer, Verlux, Vicious Panda, Vince Whitaker, Wards, Will O'Connor. <sighs> oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your truth with me. Fucking hell.